are proving that families are more at peace when the storms come their way by reading the faith and literature in God's Word. Politics. Politics is relied upon as a righteous platform to address and hopefully resolve the various cares, burdens, and issues of many people worldwide. In fact, many people have a list of issues which they rely on the position of a earthly politician, doctor, lawyer, president, etc., to help fully resolve, right? In fact, in Luke 18 and 43, look at the woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians. Look at there. Neither could be healed of any. That means any of them, which means she had choices of doctors. Mark 5 and 26 says she had suffered many things of many physicians, but nothing got better but grew worse. Have you ever had choices, politicians to pick from, doctors to pick from, lawyers to pick from, and none of them can actually resolve your problem, but their qualification was less than the type of issue that you have? Do you think and do you realize if this lady who had the issue of blood, had these doctors, had any of them resolved her issue, would she had ever went to Jesus? There's a reason why God has these things happening and limited, where our issues are impossible. Our issues are bigger than what a president, a politician, and some lawyers and doctors, and any of them can ever resolve. Because if most people can find their resolve in man, they would never turn to God. Do you know that God is calling this world, is positioning this world, is apprehending this world to turn to him, and he's doing that by making and allowing things to be impossible in our issues, and he is looking back on the other side and making it so man cannot do it. So that the only option that we have, the option that loves us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's time to put our issues on the shoulders of another government with a different governor. Look at Isaiah 9 and 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What is given to us is he who died and he who rose from the dead to where he is the one with the counsel. He is the one to deal with your issues completely and make us whole. What are we relying on today? In other words, unto us is given a real, full, powerful, issue-resolving solution. God didn't just leave us here to pick amongst lesser of two evils. Think about this next thought. There's a scripture that tells us when a spirit goes out of a man and finds seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So there is a such thing as spirits that are more evil than other spirits, spirits that are more evil or wicked than other spirits. When Jesus comes to deliver us from evil, he doesn't leave the lesser evil there. He gets them all out of there. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's all evil. Don't we want Jesus to deliver us from evil? So God is not leaving us here to actually pick amongst the lesser evil there. As a matter of fact, we need to stop using that phrase even in practical terms. I understand the point of the Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. Let's just get evil out of the picture and talk about good. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. So let's not settle in life for the less of two or three or 19 evils. Let us take our issues and put them on the shoulders of a government that's not of this world, but a government that is governed by the Holy One, Christ Jesus, that wonderful counselor, that mighty God, that everlasting Father. Let us put our issues and take them, all of our burdens, and lay them on the shoulders, not so much of Trump, not so much of even Barack, not so much of any man but lay them on the shoulders of he 
who carried the weight of the whole world on his shoulders to the cross, conquered it without sin, died for everything. By his stripes, you are healed. Every problem, every issue, every sin, poverty, he will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread. We're standing on the promises of God, not the false promises of men. Let's look at another situation of issues and the cries of the people. The Israelites had another major issue of a burden of slavery, but did God or the people of God rely on the political office of Pharaoh or the president in order to resolve such an issue? Well, let's see. I have a question. Follow me. Why didn't God simply allow Moses, who was surely next in line as successor to the throne, the political throne, as being Pharaoh? president at that time. Why didn't God just simply let Moses, who really had a heart, who really was against slavery, who really was for these people, and he surely would have waited and got to that throne and would have let them go from the kind heart that he had. Why wasn't God just relying upon that position? Oh, let's look at this. Look at the mind of God, the omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent attribute of God. God could have directed him and waited till he got into the position not long, weeks, months later, and just had him let the people go. He had that heart in the first place. But God wanted all the glory. God didn't want Moses or the position or the political position to get the glory. God wanted to part the Red Sea. God wanted to prove to his people there was no question about this thing, that it was God. Plus, God had a destination to take them to the Canaan land. God wanted Moses to be in a position where he stands still to see the salvation of the Lord. God wanted to be sure that he got the glory. God didn't want Moses to get in there, let the people go, and then Moses would have to leave the same throne to lead the people to the destination of the Canaan land, which then right after he left, that means another Pharaoh would have immediately taken a position with a different heart to come after Moses and the people just to try to kill them. Now God has to open up the Red Sea to drown them. God is saying, let's do this thing right the first time. That way Moses don't get half of the credit for freeing the people, and then God gets the other half of the credit for drowning their oppressors and bringing their enemies to their footstool. No, God got all the glory. He sent Moses Moses there, not with a staff, a presidential staff. He sent Moses there with a shepherd staff. He sent them there with something less. Moses said, I can't even speak good. Forget the eloquency of the president's speech. I want to send you there in a way and do some things in a way where the people and down to the day in 2016, 17, people can look at that story and know that it was God, not Barack. It was God, not Trump. It was God, not Pharaoh. It was God, even with the lady with the issues of blood. It was God, not the many people who who she looked upon in any of them, any choices on the ballot. You ever looked at a ballot and you can't make a choice because none of them look qualified. Well, that lady said something inside of herself. She did the same thing that Moses did. Moses went to see a burning bush and found his issues resolved in the great I am. The lady, after all doctors and men failed, she also knew to go to the great I am, even Jesus Christ, and touch the hem of his garment unto total victory and deliverance. You're going to rely upon him who created all men, who's over everyone, who's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, he who has the power over everything to resolve the issues of the people. And they were delivered by nothing and no one but God, not Pharaoh. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forevermore. Don't you see this is the same God? God is trying to let people know that there is a God. He doesn't want you to rely upon this world that cannot deliver you from the impossible. This is why the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. Are you on the righteous side today? Or you're following this world who is limited to all your impossibilities. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God, not but Trump, not but Barack, not but Hillary Clinton, not but doctors and the many doctors, not but lawyers, not but politicians, but God has delivered us out of them. How many? All. Not the possible ones, but not the impossible ones, but all, from the littlest to the greatest. Why you think God is allowing you to have a few issues today, but God is calling you, the Bible says, the grace of God has appeared unto all men. You know how God has been teaching you. You know what God has been speaking to you. Stop running and lay all of your problems your impossibilities and those things that are hard and even impossible, lay them on the shoulders of God and surrender your life to God. 
Let's also look at another situation of an issue, a situation of a man in power, the president, the king, the ruler, the political position of that time. Yes, King Nebuchadnezzar with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They did not go with the lesser of the two evils of instrument. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a number of instruments that at the sound of these various many instruments, one at a time, you should bow down and worship and do what he said as a decree. They didn't say, well, we're not going to bow down to the harp. We'll take the lesser of the evil there and bow down to the flu. They didn't bow down to any of it. Look at the answers that they gave to King Nebuchadnezzar. We will not do this thing, and our God will deliver us. Let's go back to the same scripture. Many other afflictions of the righteous, but God has delivered us out of them all. He has delivered us out of them all. So they had a faith in God. They weren't relying upon the president, the pharaoh, the king of that time, because sometimes the laws of Caesar conflict with the laws of God. But when we're following God, there sometimes is a conflict. It's nothing wrong with voting. It's nothing wrong with picking somebody as long as they are not speaking against the things of God. There's nothing wrong with following the speed limit. There's nothing wrong with picking up government cheese and eating it. There's nothing wrong. But when we begin to see that in following God, something of your decree over here is not agreeing with the word of God. So they stood next to God in the face of King Nebuchadnezzar and said, we will not do this thing. The scripture says that King Nebuchadnezzar, when he heard these words, he was was furious. He was furious. Are you caring today who gets mad at you because you didn't vote? People are furious because you didn't vote. They are furious because of who you voted for. They are furious because as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you set this one out. This one, I'm not going to put my stamp on the ballot. I'm not going to go with you on this one. What do we see next? We see Jesus. We see the Son of God standing with them as a fourth image and a fire, whereby they wasn't touched by the smoke. They wasn't touched by the fire. Matter of fact, the people that threw them in the fire, after they had been turned up seven times hotter, they got killed. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, the righteous people of God, were delivered. What I'm saying to you today is the Bible tells us to approve of things that are excellent. We use righteous judgment. We can disagree with things, and we can agree. We can approve of things, but we also have the ability to disapprove to sit things out, to not go along with, to pass on this for the sake of our convictions in Christ Jesus. In the end of time, God wants to look at you and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, not well done, thy good and faithful black man, because we follow what black people have fought so hard to do, and we just follow the tradition of it, even if the thing don't make sense. Can I tell you something? I remember one time I got hungry and I wanted to go to this restaurant to get some fish. It was a Chinese restaurant. And a friend of mine said, no, let's go to San Pablo in Berkeley, somewhere where a black-owned business, a place probably they fought hard to get a small man's business loan, a place where they probably fought hard, harder than the Chinese, to finally get the opportunity to open up a business in this particular community. Sure, I patronized them, and I went. I got there, and this fish was so stale. This fish was so terrible. Let me tell you something. When you go to a movie theater and you see fresh popcorn coming off the tray, coming off the mechanism, most of the time people say, can I have that fresh popcorn, and you'll eat the fresh popcorn. But there's nothing wrong with the other popcorn that was sitting there maybe five minutes before. You'll eat that too. Can you imagine how terrible fish had to be for me? You throw the fish away. I didn't even want my money back. In other words, I know we fought hard to open up a business as black people, and it probably was easier for the Chinese or for any white person to open up a business. But if I'm getting sick at the stomach, if I got a big food poison problem and an issue inside of me because of that, why am I going to go with the tradition of what black people had fought for instead of making an individual choice and sitting this restaurant out because of the evil? I'm not picking the less of the two fish, the less of the stale one over the stale, stale one. I'm not picking any of them. I'm going to get food poison and die. God is saying use righteous judgment. I want God to deliver me from all evil. Now, let's look at another situation of people and a president or a king or a ruler or a person in a position of political power. His name is Pilate. We know of the situation when Jesus is in trial. And Pilate is there. Pilate is kind of like the kind of person where if Jesus' mother would have been voting before Pilate was in office 
and he was running with someone else, she probably would look at Pilate, shake his hand, and say, I'm voting for Pilate because Pilate is so nice and kind that if Jesus, my son, was in problem or in trouble, he looked like he would release Jesus. He would look at this fairly. He would look at it and release Jesus. So look at the story. The Bible says that when Pilate told Jesus, don't you know that I have power to let you go? Meaning I'm in a position to where I have the power to let you go. Jesus looked at him and said, you have no power except it come from above. Now, when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, he got furious. That's like a bad president in office who you don't want in office. But still, Jesus didn't rely on his office to protect him. Oh, God got his people no matter who the president is. But let's flip that back to Pilate. Pilate is like the president of the person you would want to vote in because he seemed like he would have Jesus back, and he did. Matter of fact, when Jesus said that thou hast no power except to be given above, it says that Pilate wanted to release Jesus. No matter who the president is, even if you vote for the person you like and want, and they are the Christian of Christians, do you know that certain things have to fulfill themselves, that no matter what Pilate wanted to do, Jesus was going to the cross anyway? That's why you see certain things. Things as Jesus within his journey, it says that it may be fulfilled, that it may be fulfilled, that it may be fulfilled. I don't care who the president is, good, bad, evil, or your mama would have been in there. She would not be able to stop destiny. What God is saying is, yes, approve of things that are excellent. Vote for things. If somebody say 2 plus 2 is 4, you agree. If you hear somebody say 2 plus 2 is 89, you disagree. But at the end of the day, regardless of where people take a stand, God is in control. God is going to bless his people. Certain things are going to fulfill itself. This is why Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Why do we think this world is going to be made a better place? Who would turn to Jesus if you can find peace in the world? Who can turn to Jesus if the doctors could heal every impossible issue of blood? Who would turn to Jesus if man would actually resolve your problem? God doesn't want the world to be the solution, because why would you come over to the solution, which is Christ Jesus? So this world is going to wax worse and worse. In the last days, perilous times shall come. It's a description. God has given us a description of something that no president is going to make better. So the only hope for us as Christians, or for us as believers, for us that believe that Jesus is the answer, this is the perfect time. The timing of this is perfect to go to the street. The timing of this is perfect while people have no hope. This is the perfect time to not only preach Jesus, but set an example example so they can look at you so they can see the word of God because nothing else is working this is the perfect time we already have a governor we already have a wonderful counselor he's been there all the time so that some of us will pray that the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest and go to that harvest and preach him teach him be an example of him so that now that everything else has failed now that the doctors can't do it the president can't do it the politicians are lying they don't look right sound right feel right nothing good that is the perfect opportunity to take the churches to the street to the homes even if it is one on one Remember in the 8th chapter of Acts, God told Philip to go climb in a chariot and sit up and preach Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Don't underestimate the one-on-one -on -one situation. Don't think it always has to be a mega church. It has to be 5,000 people, 500 people, or everything is televised and everything is known. God is saying, get out there. Open your mouth. Get out there. No matter if somebody says, you ain't doing nothing. That's not a ministry. That's nothing. Yeah, but it saved one person today. Somebody turned to Jesus today. Somebody in despair that had no hope had their issue resolved in Christ Jesus. Can we look at this a little bit further? In terms of tradition, in terms of following your race, in terms of following your family, your tribe, let's look to Zechariah in the book of Luke. The angel Gabriel said to Zechariah, I stand in the presence of God, meaning the name John is coming from heaven. What am I saying here that relates to issues? The name John was not traditional in his family. Matter of fact, there was an issue amongst the in-laws, or as my father would say, the outlaws of cousins, uncles, aunts, sons, daughters, and people, and mothers, and aunties coming together trying to run your house. They looked at Zechariah as he was silenced for nine months where he could not speak of And they looked and looked at all they fought for, all they strove for, all they were accustomed to, the tradition of this family, this nationality, Zechariah was a traditional name, Zechariah the second, or Moses, or Abraham, or something that was traditional of what they fought for, what they lived for, what has been the going.
ongoing tradition of that thing. But God, do you know God sometimes will break the tradition? He doesn't want you doing the black thing, the Jew thing, the Zachariah thing. God is not going to say in the day of judgment, well done, thy good and faithful black man. We want to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Are we here to serve God or go along with man? Sometimes it's good to go along with some things as long as it does not violate what the angel or what God told you. So God is telling him to do something different than the flow of the tradition of his people or his family or his tribe. I know we have fought, but not everything we fought for, not every piece of fish, not everything is totally going to end up in a position that agrees with my own obedience or a conviction. Zechariah was convicted. So what did he do? He got a piece of paper, a ballot. <laughs> we know the story. He wrote this. When he wrote John, he wrote what God told him. He wrote, what are you writing down? You don't have to write what somebody else is writing. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. Zechariah takes a piece of paper, and they're looking at him, thinking that he's going to go along with what they want, trying to start division. Look at all the division that happens between things because you don't do what they do. You didn't vote for who I voted. You set this one out. But you what, look at the division that black people, white people are having amongst trying to even find out what decisions you make when really you have an individual right to actually serve God in the way that he has revealed things to you because God is not relying upon the political office anyway. Look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptized Jesus, but in the mind of John the Baptist for a second, he thought from a traditional standpoint, shouldn't it be me that's baptized of you? But Jesus had a purpose. What Jesus told him is, become to fulfill all righteousness, the root word right. Sometimes doing what's right is not the tradition. What's right is what God is showing you in the moment, and you break and do things a different way than you used to do them. We live from day to day, and we listen to God. Jesus said, thus it becomes to fulfill all righteousness. Suffer it to be so for now. Suffer it to be so, meaning for now I'm going to sit this one out. For now I'm going to do it this way. For now, Zechariah might call his next son Zechariah the second, but this one is going to be called John. This debate this presidential election, I'm doing something different. God told me to do something different. This one, I'm going to baptize you. This one, you're going to baptize me. Because the right thing to do sometimes moves from moment to moment with the move of God, and it doesn't vibe with tradition. This is why Jesus said you have made the commandments of God of non effect by your tradition. Let's look at Peter on the roof in the 10th chapter of Acts. Peter was on the roof, and it said he would have come down. Meaning, traditionally, this was something he did as a root king, and he was married, and he was staying with Simon the Tanner. It said he would have come down, meaning his plan. It didn't say he would have come down and smoked crack. He would have went to the strip club. He would have robbed First National Bank. It didn't say anything bad. Even good things God will interrupt. He would have come down and would have eaten because they were down there preparing food. None of this was bad stuff. They weren't preparing drugs, crack, guns, knives, prostitutes. They were down there doing a good thing. God doesn't just interrupt bad things that we should depart from. God even interrupts our daily routines of even things that are good to give us something better. So it says that God interrupts this, holds Peter into a trance, takes him on another vision, and then he finds himself later coming off the roof, meeting up with Gentiles. Not something he never did. He became to walk in a new aspect and dimension of his ministry, not doing what he would have done next, but God can interrupt everything we used to do, everything. He wasn't used to sitting with Gentiles. He stick with the Jews. I stick with the blacks. I stick with the black restaurant. I stick with this. Yes, that's traditional, but sometimes God said, today it's going to be a new thing. Today I want you to name him John. Today Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Use your judgment and stick this one out. Today I want you to baptize Jesus instead of Jesus baptize you. Today to do something according to the leading of God's spirit, even if the rest of the black, white, and Chinese did not get that revelation. This is why Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Okay. Okay, they say this, some say that. But he asked Peter, who do you say? In other words, don't follow them, what God has given you. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father revealed this unto you. Sometimes God just wants you today to go on a fast, you to back off from everything, you to go to a mountain and pray, you to make the decision in terms of what he has given you. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much 
is required. I don't know how much knowledge the next man has. I don't know whether I'm more than you or less than you. But according to where I stand in God, I make decisions. We as the children of God make decisions on the enlightenment and the measure of enlightenment and faith that he has given us. It may differ from yours. This is why Paul said in one part of the scripture, if a man is weak in the faith, if a man believes that he should not eat meat, in their mind, God is saying he will honor that faith at least as a loyalty that they want to be right with God. Because if I think that's wrong, God will honor the fact that I want to be right with him. You may laugh at me or her or all these groups of people, but if I think I don't want to do this, God honors that as saying, at least in your mind, you're conscious, for conscious sake, you are lining up with hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is why Jesus told John the Baptist, thus it becometh to fulfill all righteousness. Even in false doctrine, God say, come out of her that you be not partakers of her plague. Not pick the lesser of an evil. In fact, the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. For all that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of all them that diligently seek him. Have God ever got mad that you put all of your trust in him and did not trust in man? The Bible says trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. Who said that it's a sin not to vote? Even if King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't in office yet, but he was actually presenting his policy on what he would do with the various instruments and his requirements, they would not even have voted for him. But he was already in office, so they just took it there and looked at the particulars. Now, let us go back to Pharaoh. Let us go back to Egypt, to where even the kind-hearted Pharaoh, or a president, in the land at that time, this Pharaoh had issues with himself too much for himself to resolve or be at peace about. He had to call for a faithful man of God named Joseph. We know the story. Who came to Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and tell Pharaoh, the president at that time, what's going on, what is, what's going to be. This is why Jesus tells us, the saints, that we are the light of the world. For the world, presidents, pharaohs, kings. Look at Genesis 41 and 15, where Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard of thee that thou can understand a dream to interpret it. That's Genesis 41 and 15. Listen, there is not in Pharaoh's staff or presidential staff or cabinet to understand what is going on. There's none. He had people. He had counselors and he had different people. But they obviously didn't have the understanding. So it looked like God is trying to actually work from inside the cabinet's office and the Pharaohs and the kings. Look at what Pharaoh says. Pharaoh told Joseph that I heard you can understand. Thanks to God, we are the one that have the understanding, which is why Jesus told his disciples, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. On another occasion, when Jesus was with his own disciples, the scripture says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. People, if you don't get on God's side in Jesus, and Jesus don't give and open your understanding, the world won't even have it to understand their own personal issues or an understanding of any of the scriptures, what is, what's going to come, what's going on, or how to resolve it. Even one of the most famous quotes from the man of God, speaking of Joseph again, to his own brothers that sold him into slavery, which is in Genesis 15 and 20, listen, it quotes, Ye thought evil against me. God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive, end quote. In other words, even though it may seem like Pharaoh is the one that promoted Joseph, the same Pharaoh who couldn't even know what was going on, didn't know his dreams, the same Pharaoh didn't know what he was dreaming, didn't have no understanding and no one around him, God was actually setting this up for the people of God. See, God don't really need a presidential office or to need nobody elected in. God can use anything he wants, but he's always really setting people up to come to salvation, setting up things for the people of God to get and persuade them, setting things up. Notice that Joseph did not give Pharaoh the credit. He says that you, speaking to his brothers, meant it for evil, but God, not Pharaoh, but God. In other words, he knew all the time, even though Pharaoh was in office, it really wasn't Pharaoh, it was God. Because Pharaoh really didn't even understand what's going on and what Joseph understood. God doesn't need the president, the president needs God. And we as the people of God, like Joseph, don't need the lack of the president's understanding. He needed Joseph's understanding. And this applies to all kings, presidents, no matter who's in office. Look at what King Agrippa, we know the story of King Agrippa. Look at what he even said on another occasion to the apostle Paul after Paul enlightened the king. 
The famous words of King Agrippa to the man of God in Acts 26 and 28, even a song was made by this called Almost Persuaded. Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Same thing with Pharaoh. I don't care who it is through all times. God is setting things up for us to be their persuasion, for us to persuade them. How can they persuade us when we are the light of the world, when Christ is using us to persuade them and they don't have the understanding? Who's persuading who? Come on now. Even on another occasion in Acts 27 and 24, another occasion with the Apostle Paul, God grants safety and traveling mercies to the man of God, the Apostle Paul, and to everyone on that turbulent boat so that the man of God, Paul, can be brought before Caesar. Look at Acts 27 and 24. In other words, fear not about this plane crashing. Fear not about this boat crashing. Fear not about your car flipping over. When we live for God and we know Jesus Christ, he has purpose with where you're going to go. It says, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. But even kings and presidents, in other words, we are here for a reason to give enlightenment to them. I'm sure that God was sending him not to be persuaded of these world laws, but to persuade them of the things that comes from God, even unto the unsaved people that are in power. God is granting traveling mercies for the purpose of us getting to other people, getting to kings, getting to the world. God has us here for a reason, so that we can be the light of the world and lead people to the kingdom of God. Listen, again, let us go back to Egypt, where only the people of God were protected, favored, and saved from the death angel that killed even the Pharaoh's own son. Why? How? Without the blood of the Lamb, which was then, at that time, the blood of the Lamb was required by God to put over the doorpost. And anybody who was in there, the death angel passed over. That's what we get the term, the Passover. Even Pharaoh's son, Pharaoh the president, Pharaoh the Pharaoh, Pharaoh the king, Pharaoh with all his chariots and all his horses and all his counselors and all legislation, they could not stop what was coming. No, without the blood of the Lamb, which represented the salvation in Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, not even then nor now can Pharaoh, the president, Trump, Clinton, Barack, anybody, governors, presidents, cops, all of their hope will be lost. There'll be issues beyond what they can handle, even within their own family. So how can they save you? They needed then the blood of the Lamb, and we need today the blood of the Lamb. This is why even John the Baptist in the New Testament, when he saw Jesus coming, he lifted up his voice, knowing what time it was, saying, quote, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Today, this is the same Lamb that any president, any pharaoh, any king needs, no matter who voted him into office, you're going to need the blood of the Lamb to deal with some stuff and some issues beyond what you can handle. Thank God for Jesus Christ, our King, our Governor, because He is the answer as it is written in the Word of God, of the people of God. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The testimony that Jesus gave you through the truth and salvation and not a watered-down testimony restricted by the unbiblical guidelines of this world governmental 501c3. A lot of ministers have their hands tied behind their back because they're allowing the government to persuade them instead of we, as Paul, persuade King Agrippa in the testimony of Christ Jesus. Think about it. Without even a governor or a president's law passed or a proposition passed, God can even break down crooked cops. You don't believe me? Let's go to another occasion where Paul was locked up, beaten, locked up in a cell, but God delivered him and everyone around him in the jail cell while the same cop that beat Paul was ready to kill himself in misery. Paul has to tell the cops, do yourself no harm. We are all here.
See, Paul knew why he was here, not just geographically in the cell. We as the people of God are here to persuade them, here to persuade people who don't know what's coming that's going to cause them to lose hope because they can't see hope in who they rely upon, on their governance and their superiors. This cop was going to kill himself because he knew he was going to be killed by his superior. In other words, you can't even rely upon the people you voted in office because eventually when all things fail, people have to come over to Christ. People are being called to come over to Christ by the people of God. He comes to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? Acts 27 and 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. When you look at the sun and the stars back then, they used that for navigation. That's what made them feel secure. As long as they can see the sun and the stars, they move in the right direction. A lot of people, as long as they can see the president they want, as long as they can see their 401k, as long as they cannot leave home without their American Express card, as long as they can rely upon something earthly and that thing is intact as a promising thing that can deal with their issue, they have hope. But as soon as that thing does not look hopeful, as soon as that thing fails and they can't see the sun nor the stars for their earthly reliance anymore in a person or a thing, do you know the world is going to lose hope? But guess what? That is the perfect time. When this world loses hope in the world, that is the perfect time for the saved person, for the Christian person, the person who is of the way of God to step in. Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen to what Paul says when he steps in. It says in Acts 27 and 21, it says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. Listen, let's look at that. But after long abstinence, what is this saying? Have you ever felt like you don't have a voice? Have you ever felt like you're trying to tell somebody something right? But as long as they got all this stuff going for themselves, as long as they can see the sun and the stars for their security and things and careers and their money and them being on a stage, as long as they have all these people, as long as they have Facebook, as long as they're surrounded with validation from a bunch of things and stars and moons and things that are temporary that will go away, as soon as those things go away, it says, but after long abstinence. Sometimes we have to be quiet for a while because people won't listen to you as long as they have things, presidents of their choice and kings and things they rely upon and money and cars and everything look like it's going right. They don't know Jesus. They're not trying to turn to Jesus. Some people act like they know Jesus, but they're not obeying him because they got all these other options. But as soon as God takes those things away, no sun or stars can be seen. No hope can be seen. This is the perfect time for we who are the light of the world, we who are the salt of the earth, we who God has called to go out into the harvest. This is the perfect time while the sun and stars are not even appearing, while the things are not appearing that they would normally hope for. This is the perfect time. Even in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, we hear the story of the prodigal son. Ask yourself. Would he have come back home possibly if, while he was out there, he took a ballot and voted for the right president of his purposeful issued choice that would resolve the fact that he's getting hungry and there's not enough food out here? Would he have probably come back to the Father if he can vote somebody in who would make a change, give him peace, fill his belly with something, consider his oppression, consider his situation that he was down and out, didn't have nowhere to stay, not knowing that he did have a place to stay if he would go back home to Jesus, if he would go back home to the Father, go back to the kingdom, go back to this other government where the governor is there of Jesus to where everything is. He has to say, do you know that some people's life, we don't know what their situation is, but some people's life is going through stuff all because of their own disobedience and rebellion against the Lord. In the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, concerning the prodigal son, it says, and no man gave to him. I can imagine if somebody would actually gave to him, he probably would have stayed out there. I'm not saying don't give to the homeless and don't give, but some people, like Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Sometimes God will withhold your pocket from even having a thing so that the solution won't be money. The solution won't be bread. The solution, just in case Jesus came back that night, will be their soul being saved. So sometimes God takes money out of the equation. But when we look at the prodigal son, 
we see that no man gave to him. That was probably the best thing that could have happened. Not that we do that intentionally. Sometimes we just don't have it. But he went back to the Father. He said he came to himself and said, and had to talk to himself like the lady with the issue of blood. But she talked to herself and said, perhaps if I touch to him, I know where to go. The doctors don't have it. The swine don't have it with the prodigal son. The politicians don't have it. Nobody has it. It's probably good that they don't have it because the prodigal son probably would not. I don't know. Sometimes God allows the only direction of hope to be the only one who really loves you, which is Christ Jesus. Let us go home and let us call people back home to redemption. Call them back to who Jesus is, and he's calling them. This is the perfect time when you see the prodigal sons out there. This is the perfect time when people have no hope. This is the perfect time because we don't have the perfect president to your choice and to your liking. This is the perfect time. Quit trying to make the world a better place from the politicians and realize that the answer was already there hanging on a cross. The answer was already there when he rose from the grave the third day. The answer was there with all power that he rose with. The answer is there sitting at the right hand of God saying, come unto me, all ye that do labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. People are rest for us and for this world. It's not in this world. It's in Christ Jesus. Take your issues and lay them on the shoulders of Christ Jesus. Kids become worse women, worse men. The book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verse 10. Should have been the daily bread your mama should have read. But the parents lived in sin and raised the living dead. I'll never sell my body, she said. I'll never do. Storms came, it rained, and like she never knew. Then she blinded her mind from the ways of God's truth. Went from nurse to prostitute on her W-2. atheists in their glory navy seals decorated you gotta hear the story ambushed by enemies fell in death against the odds guess what they scream blast that's right god there's a bird on my shoulder shall i kill it that was fun went from birds to killing blacks with a gun sagging pants no more don't even try on get a belt for your jeans try suit and tie on you don't get old being a fool you gotta preach a village to raise kids so let's teach get prayer back in the home let's get back to the love cause prayer's disappearing like a ring around the tub Jesus, we thank you for dying for our sins and rising in complete victory for our sakes over everything that we would face. I now accept your deliverance and salvation in confession that where I am in my own sins is not your loving will and plan for me. Jesus, you said with your own word in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And because you cannot lie as God, I now ask your forgiveness. 
forgiveness and your help and your power to deliver me from the position of darkness and sin into the position of salvation in the light in Christ as my personal savior for all of my days. I now with your strength and grace turn from all sin and commit to reading and following your empowering word as my daily bread. Jesus, we thank you.